Hello everyone and welcome to your Glasgow video report for week 31, 2023. Now, last week when we were looking at Wales, that was some pretty heavy on-chain analytics, right? We really went down some pretty, you know, a lot of those tools are very nuanced, very new, pretty heavy stuff. So today we're actually going to pare it back a bit and have a bit of a break. We're going to be looking at what I think is the most important metric in all of on-chain analytics, and that is the realized cap. And this may sound a bit fundamental, right? People are like, oh, I know what the realized cap is. Well, I guarantee you that you don't know how far this rabbit hole goes because I am still exploring it. And uh, really, when we look at all of the on-chain space, I cannot even begin to tell you how much value is either a direct derivative of or an idea that comes from the realized cap. It is one of the most powerful tools in the entire discipline um, and getting a good grasp of it really is the first step uh, to kind of elevating your on-chain analytics. So the Realized Cap, it was actually spawned back in 2018. Uh, Coinmetrics was the first company that kind of came up with it. And what it relies on is just an absolutely genius concept of price stamping. For every UTXO within the entire Bitcoin chain, what we do is that whenever it moves on chain, we assign a price stamp to it. So what that means is that we can look at the price when a coin was moved, and then we can compare that to when it is spent. And suddenly we can start saying, well, we can actually discount all of Satoshi's coins, which were moved at $0, even though there's a million of them, they're not worth anything on a realized sense. Likewise, the person who transacted yesterday has a cost basis of 29,500, and whoever transacted uh, back in November, 2021 has a cost basis of $69,000. So what we really look at here is what is the cost basis for every coin? And because it represents that cost basis, it's also going to capture the capital that flows in or out of this space. Because in order for a coin to move, somebody has to make a very conscious decision to move it. Now, on a micro scale, right, on an individual level, sure, you may have bought your coin at, you know, 29,000, you withdrew it at 30, but on the aggregate, it is remarkably clean. It's one of these things where there's error bars on every single transaction, but those error bars kind of cancel each other out when you look across the entire network. And time after time, and as you'll see today, cycle after cycle, we get these patterns that are just so elegant and so repeatable that we can start to really find signal out of it. So we're really going to go a bit, just a bit of an exploration. We are only going to scratch the surface of what you can do with a realized cap. Um, this is something I'm spending a lot more time focusing on. So uh, there will be follow-up series. Um, this is really a bit of a primer to get you in the mood and understanding why this metric is so important. So let's get started. So here we are starting with the humble realized cap. So as we discussed before, the realized cap is essentially the, the value, the cumulative value of every coin at the price when it moved. Now, why does this matter? Well, you can see this kind of this stair-stepping pattern immediately, right? It goes vertical during bull markets, and then it goes sideways to down during bear markets. Much like the price chart, you can see that the early history just doesn't exist. We will zoom in on this in, in a second. There's a lot going on down here. It just gets compressed to nothingness um, and requires a log scale to view. Now, what's really happening here is that during uptrends, Coins that were acquired in the bear market are revalued to higher prices. The smart money who buys the bottom sells the top. So you can see here that when this really starts to escalate in 2021 is as we break the previous cycle $20,000 all-time high. So what you see is that this is coins being sold, coins acquired cheap and sold at a higher price, going from an $8,000 cost basis to a $50,000 cost basis or a $60,000 cost basis. Now, the exact opposite happens during a bear market. During a bear market, the guy who bought his coins at $69,000 sells them at $30,000. He took a $30,000 hit times whatever the coin volume is um, that he was holding. Right? So you can see here that immediately the shape of the realized cap has a piece of information, and we'll explore this later on. We can see that it kind of has these two modes. It's got kind of vertical upwards, and then it's got down to sideways. Let's actually get rid of our recent market cycle and we'll start just showing you how the detail kind of expands. You can see that now that we're kind of zoomed in on our previous market cycles, it looks very much the same. We have our vertical plateau in the 2017 peak. Note that the realized cap really plateaus pretty early in the bear market. When that selling stops, it's usually over, right? The price up here was at uh, 17,000 when the realized cap started smoothing out. So again, you can already see there's signal in all of this. And you can also see the recovery, right? The recovery in 2019 
right? This whole period, you can see March 2020 was nothing in the amount of realized losses compared to what we had back here. Kind of gives you that confidence that this thing really does want to keep trending higher. Let's zoom in on our even earlier cycles. And as you can expect, you see all of the same behaviors, right? You can go down to all levels of granularity. So let's, uh, let's move on. But that is the realized cap in a nutshell. Now, the realized cap has two components that when summed together actually gives you the realized cap. There's what we call the thermo cap down here in blue. Now, this represents about 50 billion of the 570 billion. The realized cap's 570. The thermo cap is 50. And that represents all of the coins that are mined priced at the time when they are mined. So it's kind of like the initial timestamp that gets put on those coins. Now, once a miner spends it, it moves into the green curve, which is the investor cap. This is essentially looking at all of the coins beyond their initial mining. And look, and they will transact, they'll move around multiple times. If a coin is never spent, it will always stay within the thermo cap. Um, generally speaking, miners now don't lose coins very often. Um, but in the early days, there's lots of coins back here that never left the thermo cap. They remain in there and they've never been spent since. Now, the final takeaway from this is note that for that $50 billion, that means that the largest majority contributor to the realized cap is the investor cap. The other way to think about that, the coins that are transacting on the open market, that unless you're a miner, they're probably the only coins you'll ever see or, or, uh, or, or transact with, those are the ones that dominate the realized cap. The miners are actually a very small component, um, and I'm doing a lot more research to really describe just how small the mining component really is. But on a macro scale, it's 50 billion out of the 570. I think it's about 9% if memory serves. So most of the coins we're talking about are those transacting and moving around the system. Now this just puts in, we're gonna break that down one step further. Here's our little thermo cap, right? Here's our realized cap in black, that's kind of the target goal. And the investor cap is here in blue, right? So you can see if you added this blue zone down the bottom here to our um, investor cap, you would have the realized cap. Now the investor cap is now where we're gonna dive into because it itself has two components and these two components are so important to understand. These are the bedrock of on-chain analysis. If you can understand these concepts, your entire analysis will be elevated to just a new tier. Realize the investor cap is the component of realized profits. So all of the coins that were moved and then moved at a higher price, that's a profit that gets locked in, minus the realized losses here in the red. So if you take all of the profits that have ever been locked in by the system and you subtract all of the losses, right? Normally the profits happen in bull markets and then you take away the losses that happen in a bear and you add these together, you get the, the investor cap. Now what you can see is that the total amount of realized losses is actually larger than the realized cap is. And the profits are even larger than that. So on net, the Bitcoin market is net profitable, right? Because we have a lot more profit that when we subtract the loss, we still have a non-trivial sum, right? 300 and, sorry, I think it's about 570 billion uh, at the time of uh, time of recording. So that kind of puts things into a bit of perspective that it's actually all about that profit and that loss. But don't just think about profit and loss in terms of profit and loss. What does it mean for the investor? Well, you may have experienced this. How many times have you told your friend about, I mean, aside from a funny story, how many times have you gone and raved about how much money you lost in the market? Very, very infrequently. But how many friends do you know who've told you about how much money they made buying X, Y, or Z? Profits are what brings people into these markets. Losses tend to happen during the most catastrophic bear markets, and that is where stocks move back towards their rightful owners. It is where the hodlers come in and put a floor under Bitcoin despite all of the doom. So really, that profit and loss is both a financial position and understanding positioning is super powerful. It's essentially what we're doing here. We're trying to track where the money is flowing around the system, but also tracking the losses and the magnitude of them helps us understand when people get flushed out and when it's only the hodlers that remain. These two things work in tandem and they tell us a lot of information, which we'll continue to dive into. So we we'll start with realized profit. So again, these are coins that were acquired at a cheap price, let's just say in the previous cycle at 8,000 or 6,000 or 4,000. And you can see the enormous spike in realized profit occurs during a bull market. 
and note when it accelerates is pretty much breaking the previous all-time high. Other metrics that will start changing their behavior when you break the all-time high, long-term holder supply starts declining, coins older than one year starts declining, what does that tell you? The smart money who acquired and held their coins through the chaos of the bear, they start to distribute their coins in the bull. And you can see that the realized cap rises and rallies as those profits are taken. You can see here on our second rally we had in 2021, we had another burst of profit, but here's a piece, just another piece of information. We needed less profit to put in an equal high. That's a big bearish divergence. Less profit was required to be taken in order to establish a roughly equal high in terms of price. So it's telling you that this is kind of like an exit liquidity type event. Right, And much like our previous um, chart, you can obviously zoom in and see all of the microstructure. Right? This obviously scales with market cap, but you can zoom in and see all of the profit taking that went on um, in each market cycle. Right, The maximum profits are taken typically at the cycle top. So now let's bring in our realized loss component. Now remember, realized loss is essentially that component that only shows up in the bear markets. Now, whilst our profits was kind of like a big parabolic run, and then once it's done, it's done. Notice that realized losses take a lot longer. They're kind of spread out over the entire period of the bear, and you can see there's typically a series of capitulation events. You can see how angry 2021 and 22 was, by the way. We had the first sell-off. The first major uptick in losses after a parabolic bull market right? Here's our May 2021. That's telling you that something isn't right. This is what we call the shot across the bow. It's that first major sell-off that people go, ooh, that was different. That wasn't a correction. That felt different. And the smart money at that point in time is essentially taking the final exit liquidity. So typically that first major sell-off is kind of the scary moment where bear market sentiment starts. And by my read, in 2021, that was the May 2021. That's when the bear market on a sentiment standpoint, even though we hit an all-time high later, the bear market sentiment had started in May 2021, and it was signified by this enormous explosion in realized losses. You can also see the capitulation events. You can see when Three Arrows and Luna blew up. You can see when FTX happened. But note also that price was going lower in the back half of 2022, but the realized losses were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The same way that our realized profit, less profit, higher high, bearish divergence, less loss, lower price, that's a constructive divergence. That's getting to the point when people have been flushed out. The losses that were going to be taken have been taken. It starts to look like seller exhaustion. And again, you can spot this all through these different metrics. But really, you can see how profit and loss, they work in tandem. They offset each other to create the realized cap. But at the end of the day, these two components are what drives the human beings behind those decisions. The profit and the loss is our emotive decision. We choose to spend our coin for a profit. We choose to capitulate because we cannot deal with the pain any further. And these are the things that drive markets. And that's why getting ahead around these things is so important. Now, this is looking at the drawdown of realized cap. Now, what you'll notice is that in, uh, in the market cap sense, we go down 92% back here in 2012. I think it was 85% back here in 2015. It was 85 again um, in 2018. And then we did 75 uh, here in 2022. Now, the realized cap pulls down much less. Um, we're talking about 23%, 14%, you know, 16, I think the worst case scenario we had back here, 23%. So we're talking about roughly, you know, something on the order of a quarter, sometimes less than a quarter of the market cap. Now, why does this drawdown matter? Well, if somebody bought their coin at 50,000 and sells it at 20, they took a $30,000 loss, right, times the coin value. If they take a $30,000 loss, that's capital leaving the market. They invested 50 and they only got back 20. That capital's gone, it's destroyed. Um, so what you're seeing there is that that transfer, the, the, the drawdowns and the realized losses on net, that's capital outflow from the industry. So whilst Bitcoin drew down 85, 75, 92%, the amount of actual capital that left the market and left the asset is much closer to 20% or 18% or 14%. So we actually don't see the same level of dramatic outflows, even though the price goes down that much. 
Now, for those who are kind of thinking there's another study, which I'm not going to cover here, but the realized cap is a view of how much capital is coming in, true market capital. Coins on an exchange, we don't really care because until they get withdrawn, the human decision to say, I'm going to sell this coin or I'm going to send this to an exchange, it doesn't exist. They're one button away from hitting buy or sell. So to me, just ignore it. And in many of these metrics, particularly our entity adjusted variants, um, which you'll find in our professional plan, all of those will remove the exchange activity, which cleans up the data a lot. But what we're looking at is until a coin comes out of the exchange, we're not even going to worry about it. It's not. It's just kind of sitting there on the exchange. It hasn't had that human decision get imprinted onto it yet. Um, and even with that constraint, these things still they tell such a there's such a large subset of coins off exchanges. Um, I think it's about 88 percent or thereabouts last I checked. Um, so that kind of volume is still very significant, and we still get all of the human behavior baked into it. But really, this is telling you about capital outflows when we're seeing these drawdowns. So what we're now going to do, because as you saw with many of those previous charts, they were looking at it in USD. And as we know, with the price, with market cap, with realized cap, you can't really see what happened back in 2012. It just disappears into the mist. What we're looking at here is everything priced in BTC, the profit and the loss in BTC. Now, what this does is it normalizes across all of the cycles because we're removing the coin price and we're only looking at how much Bitcoin volume was realized in profit or loss. And you can immediately start to see some really interesting cycle patterns. There's a certain threshold that we hit when the profit is simply too large. Remember, this is the counterintuitive thing about Bitcoin markets. When people are taking profits, that is the thing that eventually puts a top in because the profits get taken at the local tops all the way up to the global top until it oversaturates demand. And that's what literally creates the bear. You oversaturate with too many coins coming back into circulation. There's not enough demand. It gets overwhelmed. So ironically enough, the period of maximum profit is actually the top. And likewise, the period of maximum capitulation these massive red spikes here, this is historically where we see these capitulations, these complete flush outs of everyone who is going to sell is done. They're out. So what we're seeing here is these major events. And you can use this to help understand where we are in the cycle, right? Now, where we are um, today, you can see it's very, very small, right? There's, we've seen the capitulation of FTX. We saw it after Luna and Three Arrows, and we're kind of pretty quiet at this point in time. One more takeaway from this. You can see this little blue line here. This is issuance. So think about this as daily profit taking, daily loss taking, and daily issuance, all on the same axis, BTC volume. What you can see is that in the early, in the early years of Bitcoin, right? 50 BTC per block, 25, pretty much to the second halving, maybe not at the bull market peaks and the bear market bottoms, but through most of the rest of the cycle, issuance was meaningful it was roughly equal to profit and loss. Therefore, the mining had a very significant impact on what's going on in the space. If we look at it today, you have to squint to see it. Now, when we're very quiet and there's not much going on like where we currently are, issuance has a, a larger impact. But during the full bull and the full bear, mining does absolutely nothing because most of the value is the coins that are already in circulation. So we've talked, you know, th this is one of these topics that um, it takes a bit of thinking about, but really the profit and the loss, particularly today, drives the vast majority of the momentum. The actual people transacting with the existing supply, taking profits, trading, hodling, all of this behavior, um, taking L's, this is what drives the market. The issuance is a very small component by comparison. Changes, obviously, as the market goes from quiet to booming. Um, or to chaos, but generally speaking, the issuance is a small component. It just kind of puts things into scale and perspective. Now, another way to visualize this is by what percent change? Well, how much did the realized cap change on a percent basis? Um, which again, percentages are really nice to normalize things. Um, here, I've just visualized those losses and profits, um, obviously in two different axes, uh, coming from top and bottom. But again, a really nice tool to just help spot periods of extreme. And those extremes typically correlate with cycle transitions. So positive changes you can see happen during a bull and they crescendo near tops. Note that profit 
collapses to nothing very soon after. It goes stagnant until 2019. There's like a whole year where nobody was making any money, right? It was all dominated by losses. And you can see the capitulation event stands out like a sore thumb, right? Which then leads into the 2019 rally. So these extremes and these kind of patterns of behavior on net shows us the dynamics of the market. It helps us visualize inflection points, major topping signals, major bottoming signals, how the market is behaving based on the value flowing in or out, the profits and the loss, the changes in the realized cap. That's really the dynamic that we're tracking here. And again, we've really only, we've barely strayed from the realized cap. And again, this is just scratching the surface, the derivatives of where you can take profit and loss, which is a whole nother video, um, where you can take those components into cohorts. Um, you look at it from long-term, short-term, you look at it into SOPA, you can do all sorts of magic with it. These are just exploring kind of the most fun foundational principles of uh, what goes into the realized cap. So just to kind of close out, I want to touch on a couple of applications, um, touch on a couple of very popular metrics and just really explain why they're so useful. Um, and they're all pretty much direct descendants uh, or some derivative of the realized cap, just kind of showing you how pivotal it is. Now, the MVRV is, I mean, it's one of the, the best metrics. It's just a fantastic oscillator. Um, and it is essentially, because the realized cap is the cost basis, we're taking the ratio between MV, market value, and RV, realized value. It's basically looking at what's the current price divided by the average cost basis, right? And if you think about that, that is an unrealized profit or loss multiple. How in the money is the market or how out of the money is the market? Now, I won't spend too much time on the MVRV because we have a whole paper, which you'll find in the description below, called Mastering the MVRV. Um, aside from the realized cap, that is the paper that you want to assess and actually have a read of because that is the quintessential on-chain tool. Um, this is a good example of just a very simple cycle indicator. When it's above its 100-day moving average, typically we're in an uptrend. But here's the most important thing. Here's the nuance of why this thing is so special. At the top, what did we see on the realized profits? Everyone sells, the smart money that is. But who are they selling to? Well, they're selling to top buyers. What happens when all of those coins now have a cost basis of 20,000 or 65,000, right? Or back here it was 14, 1,400. What happens when all of those coins now have a very high cost basis? Well, price goes from 20 to six and look how devastating. This is the unrealized profit. Everyone's on the moon having a fantastic time and they just absolutely collapse. The profitability of the system gets wiped out. And remember going back to the first thing I said in this, uh, this session, how many times have you gone and bragged about how much money you lost in a market? Very, very infrequently. So this event, this top heavy market and this collapse of MVRV, you can see it in every previous cycle, these dramatic drops, these bearish divergences. We cover all this in the, in the, in the research paper. That is the thing that creates that big spike of realized loss. It's what shifts bear market sentiment. It's what gets everybody on the other side of the boat, it scares people. And that scare, that loss, that unrealized, um, uh, you know, basically seeing all those red candles, that is what creates the bear market sentiment. And that echoes for the next two, sometimes three years. Um, but essentially that's what the uh, this metric is tracking. And the exact opposite happens at the bottom. Coins get distributed to the lows, people capitulate, massive realized losses. There's no sellers left, you get seller exhaustion. And all those coins suddenly return to a very swift realized profit. That is what creates the next market structure. So the MVRV is super powerful, but it all comes back to that very simple concept. Where were those profit and loss taken? Now, the realized cap holo waves, this thing is one of my favorite metrics. Um, I use it all the time. It's very similar to the holo waves. But if you look at the traditional holo waves, there's a big purple bulb up here. That's Satoshi's and the early miners, right? Coins that are older than 10 years old. So on a BTC basis, there's 1.4 million coins that haven't moved since 2010, but they were moved at $0. They have no realized value. So do they really matter? Not, well, I mean, they do if they get spent, but if they get spent, this metric will auto correct. What you can see here is that our 10 year old coins have no value. Our seven to 10 year old coins have no value. 
right? These are very, five to seven is only barely getting just the tiniest little bit of value because they were moved at dollars, cents, $10 at most. So when we're looking back over this period of time, these coins have a very, very small amount of the value in the market. What happens at bull market tops? Well, the smart money with old green coins sells them to new buyers who heard about Bitcoin on the, on the news or because their friend told them they were getting rich. This big red bulb here is top buyers, a swelling of value held by coins that recently transacted. This is the signature of the top buyers. What is the signature of the hodlers? A swelling out of all of the older coin bands. This is the people who are buying in the bear. They hold for one month, three month, six month, one year, two years. They don't care about the price. These are people who hodl and they put their coins away and they're waiting for the next cycle. So you can actually visualize and see these cycles. I will often use a binary system. I'll either look at coins, you know, maybe six months or three months is my threshold. I'll turn all the coins off older than that or all the coins off that are younger than that. And then I can see what are the old money doing and what are the new money doing? Because a coin can only be old or young. It can't be both. So it's a really nice way to just frame this up. Now, another very popular metric, and this is the second last one uh, as we get towards the end of this. This is the net unrealized profit and loss, um, often called NUPL. Um, and this particular metric, it's, it's basically a derivative of the realized cap. It is the market cap minus the realized cap. And think about what that is. How much, what's the spot price minus the cost basis as a proportion of the market cap. And what's really nice about this, it just helps us visualize the cycles, right? And obviously it's color coded for easy understanding. But when we get into these real extremes, right? Market tops, typically speaking, if every man and his dog is in profit, that's usually a good sign that things are starting to get pretty frothy and pretty overheated. In many ways, this is just another way to visualize the market cycle that everybody knows about when they, when they kind of enter markets and typically you've got to go through one cycle yourself to kind of experience it. But all that's, that market psychology is all baked into the amount of profit or loss held within the coin supply. Massive losses create sellers and eventually they exhaust sellers. Massive profits also create sellers but they also create a lot of buyers, right? And they are on the wrong side of that trade. And that is essentially how these structures tend to go. Now, closing out with that very same topic, and this is just a, a kind of a final note to show you that this is just the surface of this rabbit hole. This is our Nupal, just shown in a different format. You can see here when it, when it was red, here it's actually just negative under zero. Well, we can also break this down by when did you acquire your coins? We can look at, for example, the short-term holders, this is that hot ball of money that's following the price. Within the last five months, that's kind of that red zone of the realized cap hodl waves. They're always following the price. We can calculate all sorts of things like their cost basis and all that fun stuff. But notice that the short-term holders at the bottom, they capitulate first. They are the first ones to bail out of the system. They're also the last ones to buy the top. The short-term holders, typically speaking, are the ones on the far extreme of the market. To be a short-term holder at the bottom means that you were the you bought like a couple of months ago and it just it's the dip that keeps on dipping and eventually you go I'm done I'm out I hate this thing I'm finished. So short-term holders typically at cycle extremes are the kind of speculators who are following the price. Well then we've got the hodlers, the long-term holders. Now their profit and loss is a much more kind of cyclical manner, but note how much they get destroyed in the bear. What happens is the bear markets are typically like 12 to 24 months long. But in the first year, there's a bunch of people who bought the top and they still think the bull market's going to continue and they keep buying and they keep buying. And then finally, the price absolutely nukes and they all go underwater. So suddenly you've got this market where everyone's underwater. No one's in profit. People are just, there's capitulation happening all over the place. We can actually map this out and look for that point of maximum pain. Show me the areas, right? Which is what this chart's about to do. Show me all of the areas where the whole market in orange, the short-term holders in red, and the long-term holders are all underwater. Absolutely everybody, no matter when you bought your coins, is underwater on their holdings. Not a bad way to start visualizing when things are at the maximum extreme. So now you can overlay 
look at the realized loss at this point in time, look at the realized cat percent change, all the metric, the drawdowns, all the metrics we covered helps us describe a market low. Well, then we can look at it on the other side and we're going to use a bit of statistics here. Show me when at least one of those Nupal charts for the market, for the short-term holders or the long-term holders, show me when it's above one standard deviation of its long-term mean, right? Show me when we're getting statistically out of band for at least one of them. I don't care which one, just at least one of them. That's what these yellow zones are showing us. Now that's not half bad, right? We're starting to get local peaks. We're starting to get cycle peaks, but it's really telling us that it's pretty hot through most of the bull market, right? 2013 is a bit of an exception. Um, this thing here managed to pick up both, but it's a bit of a broad base. So now let's go one step deeper. Show me when two of those models are above their one standard deviation band. Now this is not rocket science, right? One standard deviation is just a very simple way to kind of frame things up. Um, and you can see that like, we can start really piecing the puzzle together. And what we're just simply looking for here is when is the market really, really in profit? And as we saw before, when the market is really in profit, more people start to take them. And when more people start to take them, our realized profit climbs, our realized cap goes vertical, and there's a bunch of top buyers who heard about Bitcoin on the news who just bought their first coin, which by the way, that was me back here in 2018. I was that guy. And then you'd get the bear market that follows. So you can start seeing these market cycles. They're all derivatives of people making decisions. And those decisions are typically based on profit and loss. It's kind of that fundamental factor that drives all markets. Here, we just happen to be able to see it and visualize it in full color. So thanks for tuning in for that session, folks. Hope, I mean, let me know. It's a bit of a longer one. I can see here it going about uh, just over half an hour. But uh, as you can see, I love this metric. I think it's a really powerful tool. Um, there's a huge amount of value. We have only barely scratched the surface. There's so many charts that come off this. But really, coming to terms with what the realized cap is, why it matters, why it's so important, this is essentially the crux. If you can get your head around this, all the world of on-chain analysis will become infinitely easier because at the end of the day, so much of it boils down to and distills down to the realized cap. It is essentially an amalgamation of all the profit, all the loss, all the decisions, all the wins, all the losses, everything that's happened in Bitcoin's transaction history is all baked into this one metric. And it's a really, really great tool. And you can see all of the derivatives that come out of it. So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed that. Please let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this kind of more fundamental type content. Um, and there will be more because uh, I love looking at this stuff anyway. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.